John chapter 4, verse 5 to 26, and then verse 39 to 42. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour, that means 12 o'clock in the morning. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Can the ushers kindly bring a table with water for me? Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Can you say life? The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Can you say spirit and truth? The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Now I want you to go to verse 28. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came to him. Now I want you to turn to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in Jesus because of the word of the woman. Because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed them two more days. And many more believed because of his own word. Today is Resurrection Sunday, and you may have come here expecting a message about the resurrection, and it's true. This message, even though it's not directly connected to the resurrection accounts of the gospel, is about the transforming power of God's love. The resurrection power of God's love that you will experience in your own life just as this woman did in her own life. Amen. So the main subject in this story is the Samaritan woman. This woman had three things that were against her. Three strikes. Number one, she was a Samaritan. Samaritan in those days were considered as outcasts, half-breeds, half-Gentiles, half-Jews. And so they were considered as unclean, even worse than dogs by the Jews. 
and they were considered to have no place in the kingdom of God secondly she was a woman in that culture women had no say in society they had no part in religious activities they could not even touch the holy scriptures they could not go into the temple they had to be on the outside and women had very little say in community very little influence in fact like second-class citizens and the third strike against her was that she was an adulteress she had had five husbands so obviously she had a reputation in that village right it's not like the villages of today where there are so many people small community so everyone knew about her and the one that she was living with was not her husband and that's why she was battling with shame and she had to come at 12 o'clock in the morning to draw water when normally people come around 4 to 5 at sundown to draw water so she came in the heat of the day avoiding the crowd so that she is alone when she is drawing water because she was always treated spitefully wherever she went so those were three things that was against her so let's assume what would be the state of her mind number one she was desperately seeking for love and acceptance that's why she had five husbands and even that did not satisfy her the one she was living with presently was not her husband see in that we see a heart that is desperately looking for love and acceptance in all the wrong places it reminds me of this scripture in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 for my people have committed two evils they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters and hewn themselves cisterns or wells or buckets or septic tanks whatever not septic tanks but water tanks <laughs> broken cisterns that can hold no water so her life was like that her life represented a well that was broken that could hold no water and yet she was trying to fill it with water when you have a broken heart and you're trying to go to the world to find meaning and purpose and acceptance you will never find it because the issue is not with the world it's with your heart can you say amen so many of us today are like this woman we are trying to go to the world to fill our heart with living water but the hearts are broken and even though we're going to the world the world is never satisfying us your well can never be filled by the world pleasure entertainment money it can never fill your heart and the more you go the more dissatisfied you will be secondly let's imagine the present state of her mind she's filled with shame she's filled with condemnation inferiority complex very low self-esteem that's why she came in the middle of the day to draw water the third thing is this her life lacked meaning and purpose five husbands and staying with her sixth obviously she had no influence in society she has no significance she cannot look to anything that is worthy in her life how she can leave an impact behind now let me ask you this question are you like that woman also today maybe there are many here today you're desperate for love and acceptance in your own life maybe you have been rejected by people rejected by society and sometimes our society can be pretty harsh like sometimes we treat people who are from two different tribes as half-breeds and it's worse if you are from Naga and another community not from Nagaland we're not kind with the words to such people and even if you look a little different darker so maybe there are people here today who are like this Samaritan woman looking for love and acceptance yet ostracized rejected because of your background because of your father and mother maybe they're alcoholics or maybe they are divorced for whatever reason maybe you're going through internal issues in your own life brokenness shame guilt because of whatever you may have done or maybe doing even right now or maybe you are filled with hopelessness because you think and you feel your life lacks significance your life lacks meaning 
You have tried many times to succeed in education and business, and yet there has been no success. And so maybe you feel like this woman would have felt when she met Jesus. Now I want you to point you to the main lesson in this story. And the main lesson is this. Her brief encounter with Jesus so changed and transformed her life. So touched her, her brief encounter with Jesus, that it radically transformed her life, even in that brief moment. Do you know that God can do miracles even with a five-minute prayer? Even with one touch of prayer upon you, God can do miracles. If you look at the tone of Jesus in the way he interacted with this woman, you can see a tone of love, acceptance, gentleness, and kindness. And maybe it was necessary for all the disciples to go into the village so that there is no interference. Because Peter may have said, she's a Samaritan. The sons of Jesse, James and John, the Bible calls them sons of thunder. It means they were angry disciples before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe they would have condemned her and judged her. So Jesus, knowing that, sent all of them away so that it was only him and her. And that interaction, as you read between the lines, is filled with gentleness, acceptance, and warmth. And even though Jesus knew she was an adulteress and knew the facts of her life, and even Jesus confronted her. By the Holy Spirit, the word of knowledge, Jesus knew her sin. Even when he pointed out her sin, it was not in judgment. It was not in accusation. It was with gentleness and love. So much so that this woman, even though she was told by Jesus in plain words, you are an adulteress, she felt loved. She felt accepted. She did not feel condemned. No, a lot of people here in Nagaland have such weird ideas about God. Hey, don't go to pastor. He will reveal all your sin to you. Right? They are afraid to go to pastor and pray because he will tell you of your sins. Now, to go to prayer with the fear that your sins will be revealed all the time is already a very wrong idea and concept about God, about men of God, and about prayer. God already knows. Why are you so afraid? Secondly, if you think that every time a prophet or a man of God prays for you, the first thing they will do is reveal your sins, you have a wrong idea about God. Let me tell you this. You do not know God. You don't know your God. All you have is religion. All you have is tradition. All you have is this wrong idea of God that is an angry, vengeful, only looking at sins God. You need to change your idea about God because that is not changing your life. Before your life changes, you must change your idea of God. Many of you are trying to change your life, but you are not changing your belief about God. You're still thinking He's an angry, vengeful God, whereas on the cross, He has proven He is a God of love and grace and mercy and tender kindness and long-suffering. Can you say amen? Change your idea about God and your life will begin to change. She felt loved even when she was confronted because Jesus confronted her in love and acceptance. That brief encounter, maybe it was five minutes, ten minutes, we don't know. It so transformed her heart. See, it was an encounter with the love of God, which Jesus carried. It so transformed her. Look at what happens immediately in her life. She loses all shame, inferiority, inhibitions. She receives Jesus, believes in Him, loses all shame, inhibitions, inferiority. Secondly, she is filled with boldness to go to the village because now her heart is filled with love for her villagers. They must also know this man like I knew this man. How many of you have that same heart for the rest of the Nagas and the rest of India? We Nagas are so comfortable in Nagaland. God love us, don't love anyone else, right? We have burden just for ourselves. But a genuine encounter with God will give you a burden for other people. Hallelujah. 
she goes to the village and shares Jesus with them. And the Bible says, many of the Samaritans believe and change because of her testimony. From a life that was bound in shame and sin, with no meaning and purpose, with no hope of significance and influence, she's transformed into an immediate, powerful influencer. That's the proper term to use today. Influencer. Hallelujah. A blessing to her entire village. I know in Nagaland, many have this mindset. I want to be a blessing to my village. I want to give Christmas in my village. That's a big thing for us Nagas. Christmas, I'm a I'm a family devoted. What does it mean? Influence your village. So it's the same heart that she carries. How did she transform immediately from a person of no significance to a person of great influence? It was one moment of encounter with the love of God. There is resurrection power in the love of God. To resurrect your life from shame, from hopelessness, from sin, from no significance to a life of significance and power and grace. Hallelujah. A transformed life is the greatest testimony of the resurrection power of Jesus. Not just healing and deliverance, but changed lives. Can you say hallelujah? Amen. This is the promise God gave to me for us today. That if you will believe this message and receive, this is what you will see in your life. Isaiah 35 verses 1 to 2. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. This specific verse came to my heart as God's promise, a rhema word. This is God's word for all of you today. If you feel like your life is like a desert, your heart is like a desert and you're dry, the Lord says, if you will believe in His word, if you will believe in His love and receive Jesus, if you will believe, and even in this message today, respond to the word, your life shall blossom abundantly and you will rejoice even with joy and singing. That means your life will represent a well-watered garden. Hallelujah. This is time for shouting. Not looking at me. Hallelujah. No matter what your marriage may be, trust in the Lord, receive His love, walk in love, your marriage will blossom in the middle of the desert. Your business can blossom. Your life, your health can blossom. This is good news. Good news is this, because it lives, all things are possible. Because it lives, there's no situation that cannot be turned around. Because it lives, He can turn your life around. Don't listen to the testimonies of the people of the world who says, I tried religion, I tried prayer, I tried all this, it doesn't work. Don't listen to that. Sometimes in a religious culture like Nagaland, we have more negative testimonies than positive. You know why? Because we try religion, we try church, but we don't believe in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. One encounter with Him, can bring resurrection power in your life. Can you say Amen? So let's look at the love of God from a different aspect today. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 19. Have you understood the love of God? And turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to be a long day today. Long sermon. Amen. Some of you are not happy. Long sermon. Amen. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He will grant you according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. May the Holy Spirit strengthen you today through this word. That Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. That you, that means all of us, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints 
what is the width and length and depth and height? And the word saints here is not referring to Saint Michael and Saint Peter, no. It's referring to every believer. Every believer is a saint. Can you say Amen? Hallelujah. The width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of God which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The fullness of God is in the knowledge of His love. If you want the fullness of God in your family, look for love. The knowledge of His love to accept it to understand it and to live in it, to walk in it. Now, Paul was writing this to the believers at Ephesus. These believers already knew God loves them. Like all of you already know God loves you, right? You already know that. But you do not know to the degree that God wants you to know. Paul is telling this church at Ephesus, I, I, I know you know God. I know you know that God loves you. But the encouragement here is deeper than that. Paul wants them to know the full extent of the love that God has for them so that they will experience the fullness of God. And may you also experience that today. So Paul describes it in these four words, the width. Everyone say the width. The width of the love of God. Do you know that human beings are very limited in the width Many of you love only your family. <laughs> Let me say this first. Some of you love only yourself. You don't even love your wife or your children. It's true. In the counseling, I've realized that there's some fathers who are so selfish, they love only themselves. Their love doesn't go beyond this. And then there are some of you who love only your fathers, your mothers, your children, just around you. That's the width of your love. And then some of you love your clan, that's it. Other clan, enemies. Same tribe, but other clan, enemies. Same tribe, but other village, enemies. So that's the width of our love. It doesn't extend beyond the boundary of our homes. Human love is always limited. But in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, we see the width of God's love. There is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free but Christ is all and in all the covenant that was only for Israel after Jesus died and was resurrected God opened the door and said all kinds of animals may now come in every tribe every nation every people and tongue and that is why Reverend Clark left New York in October 20 1868 New York 1868 traveled for 12,000 miles by steamer boat for 160 days now there's even sitting five hours in the plane we complain 160 days on the seas finally arrived in Sipsagar Sipsagar today in March 30 1869 to bring the gospel it took him another three years, 1872, before he entered the hills of Nagaland. And in his own words, he says, to go to the strange, uncivilized tribes in the hills. That's what his own words are. Strange, uncivilized headhunters. Why? What would compel a man to leave his surroundings, to go through all the pain? and the inconvenience and the hours and the heat and the mosquitoes and the sicknesses and the dysentery and the change of food and being in uncomfortable people circumstances to bring the gospel to the strange uncivilized headhunters it's called the width of the love of God there is no boundaries to his love may you also understand that and may the width of your heart also grow beyond Nagaland, beyond your own tribe. It's time for our church to embrace the nations, the unlovables. It's not enough that we receive the love of God. No, the love of God is not perfected. The love of God is not complete until you give it away. Some of you need to learn to love people other than your own tribe. 
If we love only our own tribes, it means this. The gospel has still not penetrated the hearts of the Nagas. Number two, the length of the love of God. Length refers to time. And what it means is that God's love has no expiry date. Go to the shops and you always look for expiry date. Medicines, expiry date. It means the effectiveness of that medicine has gone. Don't take it. Throw it away because it has no power. Even human love has expiry date. Do you know that? Many times as leaders, we counsel people, difficult people. We visit them in the homes. We pray for them. We give them books. We pray for them. One, two, three, four years. And still, there's not even a spark of life in them. No spark of change. So you know what we do? Hey, Charity V. It's a waste of time counseling that brother. That's what we think. So we give up praying for certain people. Yes or no? What's the use of visiting him? He's not going to listen anyway. You know what it means? Even the best of human love, pastoral love also has expiry date. But what about the love of God? The love of God has no expiry date. It means God never gives up. It means that He's always going to love you, even if you don't. He loves you on your good days. He loves you on your bad days. He loves you in your worst days. He never changes because that is His nature. And He wants us to understand it so that we draw towards Him even in our worst days, but that we also have a big heart to love those who are unloved. Look at the testimony of Paul. Paul was a murderer. Paul was a religious fanatic. Worse than the religious fanatics of today, all right? There are many religious fanatics around the world. Some are just going around bombing people all over the world. Paul was worse. His life's mission was to destroy Christianity. His life's mission was to kill Christians. That was his mission for life. If you were an apostle, if you were a believer in Jerusalem at that time, and if someone said, Paul is coming, no one wants to meet Paul. No one wants to go and talk to Paul. No one wants to go and share the gospel with Paul. Paul is considered as the most dreaded enemy of Christians. Which means all the Christians are thinking, Paul, no way. No way you can become a Christian. But the length of God's love is that even in the worst of human intentions and nature, God reached out to him on the road to Damascus. That means there's hope for you. There's hope for the black sheep of the family. <laughs> Any black sheep here? The moment I said black sheep, all your minds went to someone. <laughs> there's hope for that brother and that sister. Can you say amen? Don't give up on them. It's not you who's reaching them. It's the length of the love of God. The third is the height of God's love. 18, not 18, 1986. If it was 18, I would be 120 years old. In 1986, I climbed Mount Jafu along with some friends. I was about 15 years old then. That very moment I scaled that peak, I looked down below at all the hills, below small hills, and felt a great sense of achievement at that age. But in 1993, along with some college mates in an expedition, we climbed a peak in Ladakh which was 6,100 meters above sea level. Jafu is about 3,080 meters. So when I climbed that peak, 6,000 meters above sea level, all the other peaks I have climbed in my life, Jafu, Pule Batze, <laughs> it paled in comparison. See, we measure our challenges in life by comparing them with other experiences that we have had. Right? So when Paul speaks of the height of the love of God, he was comparing it to all other forms of love. Eros love, phileo love, storge love. Naga clan love is different. Tribal love. All forms of human love. Paul was saying, nothing is higher than the love of God. Can you say amen? It's the ultimate expression of love. What is it that attracted people to Jesus Christ? Was it the oratory of His words, the authority in His words? It may be, because there was anointing in His words. 
And some people are attracted to words only. Intellect, they're attracted only to intellect. Was it the miracles, the power, the signs and wonders, the deliverance that happened in his ministry? Many people are attracted to that alone. But what, of, what was it that caused the, the, the tax collectors and the sinners and the worst to want to come around him and be with him all through the night, eating with him? What, what, what was it? I believe it was the love of God. After the miracles are gone, after the excellence of the preaching is over, it was the love of God that drew them to him and wanted them to remain with him. You see, what's going to cause you to be faithful? What's going to cause you not to give up when you're going through the worst season of your life? What is going to cause you to be this faithful Christian when all your friends are going back to the world? Is when you know how much God loves you. What caused John to be at the cross when Jesus was being crucified? John knew how much Jesus loved him that he wrote in his own epistle, in his own gospel, I am the one that Jesus loves. When he knew how much he was loved, it caused him to be with Jesus in his worst moment. It is not just discipline. It is not just fear of punishment. It is not just what people will say. Now in Nagaland, we use what people will say as a hammer to disciple our children. Manukikobo, Manukikobo. Listen, it's not what Manukikobo. It's what Jesus has already said. He loves you. Let that be the motivation for your transformation. Let that be the motivation for your discipline. Let that be the motivation to come to church because He loves you. And if you have come to church for the first time in 2024, today, we love you still. Amen. See you in Christmas. God loves you, all right? So just pretend like you are here every Sunday. Go and enjoy the sandwich and the cake. Smile at everyone. And pretend you're a friend of everyone, even if you came for the first time today. <laughs> Let's look at the next word, the depth. 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 Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9. Now this, what happened? The picture is not there. All right. There was a picture of Jesus in hell there, but maybe it didn't come out on the PowerPoint. Ephesians 4, verse 9. This he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things God's love is so deep that it caused Jesus to die on the cross and for him to descend into the very depths of hell on our behalf so that he took the keys of death and hell from Satan for us Jesus descended into hell what happened between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday this is what happened Jesus descended into hell on our behalf that's the depth of the love of God. Which also means that Jesus can penetrate into any darkness of human heart, human nature. Any hell that you may be going through, Jesus can penetrate that and bring you out of that. The greatest degree of demon possession that we see in the scriptures is the man at the tomb of the Gadarenes in the Gospels. The Bible says that he was chained by the people and kept in the tombs. It's because he was unsound, he was violent, and he was a threat to society. He lived in the tombs near the cemetery. The Bible says that he would scream at night and cut himself cry out all night he would break open the chains he would make himself naked and run around that is extreme most of us have never seen that maybe only heard of that that's the darkest form of possession that man was literally in hell 
but one encounter with Jesus who carries the love of God and the Bible says he was completely set free he went and clothed himself he was of sound mind sat down and listened to Jesus and then told Jesus can I follow you and Jesus told him no go and preach your testimony to the other ten cities around Decapolis one encounter with Jesus brought him out of that hell if you may be thinking that whatever you're going through in your life today is hell even today respond to the time of prayer one encounter with the love of God with the power of God can bring you out of that hell don't underestimate the power of God and don't think that I am Bishi Pratnakuri Wolagi that the pastor has to lay hands on you 20 times remove all your hair also and then only the miracle will come or oh, someone has to come and lay hands 20 people have to lay hands and lay hands then only a miracle will come that you have to you know sometimes God can just do it's according to your faith did you know that see it's not like for every miracle you need 7 days 21 days 40 days of prayer no it's your faith it's according to your faith and even when people are praying for you don't look to the person look to God that means if the prayer person just comes and lays hands in Jesus name be healed and goes away don't have this Ayah. one second and again only one second at least give me 10 seconds right? don't have that attitude it's not the hand it's not the time it's Jesus it's Jesus amen Hallelujah. God's love can penetrate into any darkness. Just let's look at the love of God. God's love is so wide, it embraces everyone who will believe. It is so long lasting that it will never let us go, no matter how much we are rebelling. Number three, it is so high that nothing can compare with that love. And it is so deep that it can melt the darkest of hearts. The first call today is primarily for the church leaders and the church fathers and mothers and for those who are believers for many years. You thought you would never be called out for an altar call, right? No, this is for you. Especially the leaders need altar call. But I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. Respond from where you are. Number one. How far are you willing to go to carry the love of God to people? It's not a call to accept Jesus. It's a call to give Jesus away. The church needs that in Nagaland. People have gotten born again 100 times, 200 times in Nagaland. The Guinness Book of World Records. I've been born again 300 times. Right? I've gone to 300 crusades. For Nagaland and Nagas, it's not time to accept Christ. It's time to give Christ away. Amen. So, fathers, mothers, colony aunties, <laughs> Scorpio uncles, any Scorpio uncle? <laughs> okay. How wide is your love? That you are willing to embrace strangers embrace people of other tribe and races fathers mothers i'm really looking to you to embrace the new people in church there has been a growth in our church in the last three four months a lot of young people are now coming in don't say ayah sop nutun manu ho nutun manu so and go to the back nutun manu say ayah ahibina ahibina go and talk to them embrace them invite them to your homes give them a meal sometimes Miracles happen in the middle of meals. Invite them. Open your heart to them. Open your homes. How do I open my heart, Pastor? It's very simple. Open your kitchen to them. That's opening your heart to them. Don't just stay secluded and be comfortable. Oh, I don't want to do more than this. No. If Jesus had that heart, then you would not be enjoying His grace today. Open your hearts. Open your love more let it become wider embrace more people into your life
and you say amen embrace the nations don't say I don't want to do I, I don't want to do more I want to do less that's really not the heart of God oh, but I'm so inconvenienced exactly my job as a pastor is to inconvenience you if all the time I just listen to your I just want to be comfortable in church I'm not doing my job as a pastor at the risk of you leaving the church I'm telling you take your responsibility as a father and a mother in the church rise up and be a leader be willing to do more give more your time your heart your love because the young generation needs that many of the young people that come to our church have no father and mother some of them are from broken homes they don't have a father figure in their lives just you coming on a Sunday service and just tell them hey your testimony was powerful your song was wonderful your smile on stage was great it's going to bless them tremendously so open the door of your heart a little bit more I'm saying that to the mature believers secondly how high can you go in your service to God do you know that at the rate where God is blessing a church and the influence growing in this nation we need all hands on deck during times of war the captain says all hands on deck it means we need every hand we need people on media to design pictures we need people in the sound system we need more ushers we need people who can cook faith conference is coming we need people who can drive see the reason God gave you that wonderful car is so that you can use it for the kingdom we need people we're having so many pastors come pastor Pater is bringing about seven eight nine people from his church Ankit and other pastors are coming we need people who have vehicles who willing to say I'll drive them around let the anointing sit in your car for three days and who knows after they leave God may send someone who will stay forever next to you <laughs> Right, Akrizo? <laughs> the anointing attracts. So, we need all hands on deck. All right? How deep can you go into people's life and rescue them? People who are in messes. Go deep into their lives. Don't, don't, don't neglect them. Don't, don't judge them. See, look at people through potential not through the the present mistakes many of the young people you know they're not disciples that means their words may be a little rough they may do something wrong you may see them on the road doing something crazy and then they come into church don't criticize don't judge look at them through the eyes of God despite their present problems they have great potential Jesus saw this woman she was with living with another man not her husband had five husbands obviously everyone is judging criticizing her. the whole village Jesus looks at her and says you know you can have eternal life it's gonna change your life transform your life with the way Jesus saw her changed her and she actually became the way Jesus saw her a woman of potential influence that's the way you need to see yourself and that's the way we need to treat the young people embrace them with your heart hallelujah so can God challenge you to take a few more steps out of your comfort zone let's bow our heads and close our eyes Hey, you can contact or email us at the information given down below and if this message has blessed you we encourage you to please like share and subscribe to our channel thank you and God bless you